When I found out that the Right Honorable William Earl of Dartmouth was appointed to the Secretary of the State for the Colonies, I felt a sense of refulgent pride. I felt a plethora of emotions. He was a known friend of abolition. I felt it was actually possible to be released from tyranny. I felt thankful. And I felt that the world will soon be in a much better place with someone like the Right Honorable William Earl of Dartmouth in place to bring a voice to democracy, I was compelled to write a poem dedicated to him. To the Right Honorable William Earl of Dartmouth by Phyllis Wheatley. Hail happy day, when smiling like the morn, fair freedom rose New England to adorn. The northern clime beneath her genial ray Dartmouth congratulates thy blissful sway, elate with hope her race no longer mourns. Each soul expands, each grateful bosom burns, while in thine hand with pleasure we behold the silken reins and freedom's charms unfold. Long lost to realms beneath the northern skies, she shines supreme while hated faction dies. Soon as appeared, the goddess long desired. Sick at the view, she languished and expired. Thus from the splendors of the morning light, the owl in sadness seeks the caves of night. No more America in mournful strain of wrongs and grievance unredressed complain. No longer shalt thou dread the iron chain which wanton tyranny with lawless hand had made, and with it meant enslaved the land. Should you, my lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good, my feeling hearts alone best understood, I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's fancied happy seat, what pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labored in my parents' breast? Steel was that soul, and by no misery moved that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case, and can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway? For favors pass, great sir, our thanks are due, and thee we ask thy favors to renew, since in thy power, as in thy will before, to soothe the griefs which thou didst once deplore. May heavenly grace the sacred sanction give to all thy works, and thou forever live not only on the wings of fleet and fame, though praise immortal crowns the patriot's name, but to conduct to heaven's refulgent fane. May fiery cursors sweep thy ethereal plain and bear thee upwards to thy blessed abode, where like the prophet thou shalt find thy God. A year after I wrote this poem, I had the honor to meet the Right Honorable William Earl of Dartmouth. I traveled to London with the Wheatley's son, Nathaniel. Nathaniel was there to take care of the family business. I went along to personally take my poems to be bound and published by the Countess of Huntington. The Countess of Huntington was a good friend of the Wheatley's minister, Reverend Whitefield. Mrs. Wheatley got to know the Countess through Reverend Whitefield. After Reverend Whitefield died, the Countess and Mrs. Wheatley corresponded often. While in London, our itinerary was filled with social engagements every day. This particular night, everyone attended a ball. The list read like a who's who of the royalty world. Each of the royalties and dignitaries were introduced, and when they introduced the Right Honorable William Earl of Dartmouth, it read, The Right Honorable William Earl of Dartmouth, abolitionist and patron. Later on, he asked me to dance, and when we chatted afterwards, 
I felt like a princess at the ball that night. When I was talking to some of the guests, I overheard Nathaniel Wheatley and several others talking. The question was posed to him, Phyllis is so brilliant, gifted and such a talented writer, and is about to publish a book of poetry. Why on earth is she still your servant? I did not quite hear the answer, but I knew most of the royalties at the ball were a part of a network of abolitionists and belonged to philanthropic societies. Everyone danced the night away. I was given several gifts by the dignitaries. The Right Honorable William Earl of Dartmouth gave me five guineas. After we sailed back to America, I was granted my freedom. I pray that my brothers and sisters, still in bonds, will all soon know the blessing of liberty in this land. These past few years have seen many grumblings and mumblings by the free folks in this town. They complain about taxation without representation, about a king in a distant land having absolute control over them, about a parliament making laws that they haven't the right to make because the Americans have no compact with parliament, just the crown. My name is Felix. I am what you call a slave, a man owned by another man. I live, I work. I go to meetings on Sundays and holy days, and I want to know, where is the passion for liberty for a man like me? Contrary to what you may have heard, some of us enslaved folks can read too. I do. And in the greatest book, the good and holy Bible, there is nothing I can see that justifies my condition. As long as great folks like James Otis, Dr. Joseph Warren, John Hancock, and Samuel Adams are going to make speeches for liberty for Americans. I will add my voice to the petition for independence, for my independence as an American. I wrote this letter, and I am sending it to the governor of Massachusetts, Mr. Hutchinson, to the Honorable His Majesty's Council, and to the Honorable House of Representatives in General Court assembled at Boston the sixth day of January, 1773. The humble petition of many slaves living in the town of Boston and other towns in the province is this, namely that your excellency and honors and the honorable, the representatives would be pleased to take their unhappy state and condition under your wise and just consideration. We desire to bless God who loves mankind, who sent his son to die for their salvation and who is no respecter of persons that he hath lately put it into the hearts of multitudes on both sides of the water to bear our burdens, some of whom are men of great note and influence, who have pleaded our cause with arguments which we hope will have their weight with this honorable court. We presume not to dictate to your excellency and honors, being willing to rest our cause on your humanity and justice, yet would beg leave to say a word or two on the subject. Although some Negroes are vicious, who doubtless may be punished and restrained by the same laws which are enforced against other of the king's subjects, there are many others of a quite different character, and who, if made free, would soon be able as well as willing to bear a part in the public charges. Many of them, of good natural parts, are discreet, sober, honest, and industrious. And may it not be said of many that they are virtuous and religious, Although their condition is in itself so unfriendly to religion and every moral virtue except patience. How many of that number have there been, and now are in this province, who have had every day of their lives embittered with this most intolerable reflection, that let their behavior be what it will, neither they nor their children to all generations shall ever be able to do or to possess and enjoy anything. No not even life itself, but in a manner as the beasts that perish. 
We have no property. We have no wives, no children. We have no city, no country. But we have a Father in heaven, and we are determined, as far as His grace shall enable us, and as far as our degraded, contemptuous life will admit, to keep all His commandments. Especially will we be obedient to our masters, so long as God and His sovereign providence shall suffer us to the holden in bondage. It would be impudent, if not presumptuous in us, to suggest to your excellency and honors any law or laws proper to be made in relation to our unhappy state, which, although our greatest unhappiness is not our fault. And this gives us great encouragement to pray and hope for such relief as is consistent with your wisdom, justice, and goodness. We think ourselves very happy that we may thus address the great and general court of this province, which great and good court is to us the best judge under God of what is wise, just, and good. We humbly beg leave to add but this one thing more. We pray for such relief only, which by no possibility can ever be productive of the least wrong or injury to our masters, but to us will be as life from the dead. Signed, Felix. The Lord said to Pharaoh through Moses, Let my people go that they may worship me. Well, I ask the Massachusetts legislature only that, but what God asks for his faithful.